Hello and welcome to another episode of Full Court Finance here at Zacks. I'm your host, Ben Rains. In this week, we're going to be previewing Nike's big Q1 earnings that are coming up on Tuesday. And then we're going to do a little bit of a sports apparel roundup because there was some big news from Gap and Under Armour late last week. But before we do any of that, I want to just give a quick reminder that if you have any questions or episode suggestions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at zax.com because we always appreciate any feedback whatsoever. So now I want to get right into Nike. So we are officially three weeks removed from their big Labor Day Colin Kaepernick ad that drew up controversy pretty much everywhere. We had people calling for a boycott. Then you had others saying, let's buy more Nike. It was a big, big political uh, fiasco. It even led some investors recently to call for a vote to have Nike be more open on their political spending, to be more transparent and demand regular reporting on any type of political contributions. Uh, So that was late last week. Nike's board has recommended that its shareholders vote against that resolution, saying they already have policies in place. And then more specifically, they're saying that if they had to have even more transparency, it would, quote, put Nike at a competitive disadvantage, according to the company's proxy statement, that would reveal strategies and priorities designed to protect the economic future of the company. So they're saying, don't worry about it, we'll be fine. And it actually seems like this Colin Kaepernick ad thing has barely hurt the company whatsoever. The stock was up about 4% since that ad dropped three weeks ago. And as I've mentioned on the show before, Nike has a history of standing behind some relatively controversial figures, though you could say Kaepernick is maybe the most controversial so far. They stuck behind Kobe Bryant with his legal troubles, and then they stuck behind Tiger Woods through all of that drama. And it actually ended up paying off for for Nike, at least in Tiger Woods' sense and Kobe's sense, because uh, Tiger won his first tournament in five years yesterday, and that that took up coverage of NFL Sunday, which is really hard to do. So maybe maybe Nike knows what they're doing. And then for a little more perspective on Nike, they are they've been the Dow's top performer so far this year. Nike's up just over 36 percent since the start of 2018, which outpaces Apple's 29 percent and Microsoft's 33 percent. So they're doing really well. They just hit a new all time high on Friday of just over $86 per share, though they opened up a little bit lower on Monday morning. And before I get into any of the outlook or expectations for Nike on Tuesday, I want to give just a little bit of a a rundown of what's going on with the company and why people are so excited and Nike stock is doing so well so far this year. They had gone through a relatively turbulent stretch. Their North American sales had declined for three straight quarters in the quarter before that it was flat year over year and that scared a lot of investors because north america is still by far their biggest and most important market and then last quarter their north american sales jumped three percent to 3.88 billion that was a big deal and throughout this whole time nike's management never really wavered from saying we're going to get back to north american growth we're in a transition phase of our company And they've done just that. They've really, like a lot of other retailers, uh, they've slowly tried to transition more towards direct consumer sales through an array of apps, their own online platforms, and then partnerships with places like Amazon, Chinese e-commerce company JD.com, even Facebook. You can buy uh, Nike stuff through Facebook Messenger even. It's pretty crazy. So Last quarter, they said on, Nike said on their earnings call that Nike Direct, which is their direct-to-consumer push, drove 90% of the company's growth in fiscal 2018, and digital sales were up 41% in the fourth quarter. And that is really setting us up for what's going on right now. And obviously, you, a lot of people know Nike is still involved heavily with the NFL. They're the officially official jersey sponsor through the 2028 season. So that's the biggest sport in America. They're dominating. The second most popular sport in America, the NBA, they have that. They're only starting the second year of their big official jersey sponsorship deal. And it's also the most popular sport in China. So that's something that 
maybe not enough people know about yet, but that the NBA is quickly becoming China's most popular sport, which is great for Nike going forward as well. And that's not even getting into any of their stuff in presence in soccer, which is always expanding. But one of the things you might hear a lot of on the earnings call and what we're going to talk about a little bit later with the Gap and Under Armour is the athleisure market. That's one of the big markets that is growing across sports and retail in general, and that is something that Under Armour has failed to do, while Nike and Adidas and Lululemon and all these companies have really pushed into this clothing that is... The idea is that you can wear it to the gym, but you can also wear it maybe to work on a casual Friday, or you can wear it whatever you're doing on Saturday. Just an option that you can wear more more often, not just very specific to the gym or anything like that. So now we're going to get into the quick Q1 outlook for Nike. So it is, its revenues are projected to jump roughly 9%, just under 9% to hit $9.88 billion, and that's based on our current Zach's consensus estimates. And then meanwhile, its adjusted quarterly earnings are supposed to climb approximately 9% as well, just below 9%, to hit $0.62 cents per share. So 9% up for both earnings and revenue is what our consensus estimates are calling for. And then we've also seen some positive first quarter earnings trends that's been trending up with earnings estimates in the last 60 days for Nike, which is a good sign, meaning people are, uh, some analysts are a little more positive than they had been about Nike's first quarter earnings results. And then it's always worth noting, especially when you're talking about earnings, how often Nike does beat earnings. Their management team is pretty solid. They've topped our quarterly earnings estimates for almost five straight years. So you can maybe see that trend continuing on Tuesday. But beyond the basic top and bottom line, uh, people are probably going to be looking once again towards North American uh, revenues. And we have some non-financial metric estimates to pull out for that. So our estimates are calling for uh, just over 3% growth once again to about 4.05 billion. So the fourth quarter was a big deal when they got back to that 3% growth in North America. So investors might be excited to see once again that that North American growth is supposed to be at about 3%. And then in terms of the greater China area, which is a huge growth region for a lot of companies, and especially Nike, our estimates are calling for Nike's revenues to jump over just over 21% from $1.11 billion to $1.34 billion this quarter. Uh, so, as I said, investors might be excited to see that that 3% North American growth is back. Maybe they're hoping for a little bit more, as it accounts for about 40% of Nike's total revenues. But the only thing interesting about China, that 21% growth sounds great, but last quarter, Nike's Chinese growth in greater China was 35%. So... If that 21% that figure might lead to some people getting a little nervous right after the report, but we will see how that goes. And then one of the last big categories that people will definitely be looking at Tuesday after the bell when they report is e-commerce, which we unfortunately do not have uh, estimates for because they have not been reporting that for long enough. But besides that, footwear is their, their big category. That's where they generate a lot of their money. So that is supposed to grow by 8.4% to $5.95 billion. So revenue, total revenue up about 9%, footwear revenue about 8.4%. So some good growth. And then you got North American growth hopefully coming back as well for the company. And then their apparel division, which is smaller than footwear, which is the exact opposite for a company like Under Armour, which is a, a reason that some people don't see that company being the big growth company long term. Their apparel growth is supposed to jump 11.3% uh, to just under $3 billion. And yeah, as I said, be paying attention to whatever they say for e-commerce. That's going to be something pretty much going forward for the foreseeable future. E-commerce will be something that all of these retailers uh, are talking about in Nike, especially since 
they're making a huge direct consumer push as the the retail industry and the sports retail industry changes in a big way. But I want to move on to a couple Nike competitors who had some relatively important news drop at the end of last week. And before I get into any of that specifically, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the market, the retail market as well in the sports sense. So for the first half of 2018, you had the U.S. footwear industry growing by 7%, and this is according to NPD Group. It's a big market research firm widely cited throughout kind of the retail industry. And then so it was driven by gains in online shopping and casual footwear, which Nike performs well in. And then you had the sports leisure was the fastest growing category, so that's that athleisure you'll hear a lot about and that captured about 65 percent of the total dollar sales gained which is pretty mind-blowing and then you had e-commerce accounting for about 90 percent of the industry's gains over the past year as well and then in a separate little report this is from 2017 but i think it's it's worth referencing here the active wear apparel sales so sports apparel sports retail uh, was up about 2% to $48 billion in 2017. And this is once again according to the NPD group, and that represented about 22% of the total apparel industry just for reference there. But why I point that out is in their report on the NPD website, they said that the biggest reason that category was up 2% was driven by women's athleisure, and what they're hoping going forward or what they're expecting going forward is that men's athleisure slowly becomes more popular as these brands try to push into men's athleisure where you had Lululemon and these companies doing really well in that women's category. Which brings me to Gap because last week, uh, near the end of the week, Gap announced that they're going to roll out a new men's athleisure brand. Uh, they have a women's athleisure brand under the Gap umbrella, which also owns Old Navy and Banana Republic. That is Athleta. But for, so for the men's, they're dropping, it's, it's called Hill City, just how you'd think it's spelled. And they're calling it a, this is a, from the press release, a quote, high performance men's apparel brand offering technical clothing that transitions seamlessly through the day from working out to work to the weekend. So as I said before, that's the premise. That's what the executives of this company and the, the idea is just more things you can wear everywhere. Versatile. Versatility is what we're looking for. So you had Gap's CEO, Art Peck, basically just saying, we've had a lot of feedback from our consumers saying they want this type of men's product. So that's what they're going to be offering. It is not out yet. It's supposed to launch by mid-October, and it's going to be available at the beginning exclusively online, at not on the GAPS website. It's going to be on Hill City's own website. And then there's also going to be some of this Hill City clothing for men at select Athleta locations. As I said, Athleta is the women's version of this. It's kind of a Lululemon type of offering from the Gap that is done actually pretty well. What's interesting though about for the Gap and what I've kind of thought about the company for a while is that they're kind of in between what they want to be. Do they want to be uh, a little bit of a cheaper option? Because if they're competing against Lululemon that's at this really high price point, this menswear that they're going to offer through Hill City is also at a really high price point. The running pants are going to cost between $98 to $128. Obviously, they're, they're supposed to be good. The, the samples they have so far and what they have on the website kind of in their little lookbook is it, it looks good. It looks simple, clean lines, all that jazz. But, I mean, it, it's kind of pricey when you think about it that you already have this company, Lululemon, that has reached this kind of we have all of this cachet as this fancy high-end company who sells these yeah $120 yoga pants and now it seems like the gaps coming in and doing the same price point without as I've now said a couple times without any real standing in that that division yet of of men and women's athletic wear 
And then for a little reference for how well Lululemon's doing, uh, because they then last week actually uh, recently vowed to push their men's items, which have they've slowly been adding more to. They're predicting that their men's sales alone will reach $1 billion by 2020. So for reference, Q2, their, their overall revenues were up 25% to $724 million. And their e-commerce, they said, was up 47%. Their comps in Asia were up 50%. And their Chinese e-commerce comps were up 200%. They're still very small in China, so those those comps are going to be kind of uh, overblown just because they're so small. It's easy to get, to, to kind of grow 200% uh, in a quarter. But for reference, by 2019 for the fiscal year, our current estimates are predicting 3.66 billion in total revenues. So by 2020, they're expecting their menswear alone to be a billion. So you can see that they're really trying to push into this new category that can then maybe sustain growth for a longer period of time as they kind of become a little saturated in the women's section. And I want to close with a company that has not done particularly well in this booming athleisure business, and that is Under Armour. And they unfortunately last at the end of last week announced that they're going to cut 400 jobs globally as they try to continue to cut costs to fight against some poor sales. And despite some of the poor sales uh, and some tr things that I think are definitely trending in the wrong direction, the stock price has gone up a lot over the last year. But that's mostly because it had just tanked before that. Uh, so it, it kind of just people are, are riding it up and we'll see where it goes from there. But yeah, so Under Armour is cutting its workforce by 2% over the next period of time. And this is also the second time they've done that within the last year. So this time it's going to be 3%, excuse me, 3% of their workforce, 400 jobs roughly globally. And then a little over... A year ago, Under Armour announced similar cuts that they were cutting about 2% of their workforce, so 280 workers around that time. So over the last couple of years, they've, they've really, they're trying to not clean house, they're just trying to slim down the business. This is something that CEO Kevin Plank has said a lot. They need to kind of, they need to be quicker at their go-to-market strategies. They need to be able to churn these new looks for every season out. Uh, more quickly than they had been because it's something they talked a lot about that they they didn't know how to operate as this huge global company and it kind of happened fast and now they're trying to deal with this on the fly so we'll see how that goes for them but yeah once again there's a lot going on in this market the athleisure is something you're going to hear so much about for the next couple of years or at least uh, you have the gap doing this now with men's Lululemon is continuing to perform really well whereas Under Armour on the other side, they have not seen their athleisure business grow as they would have liked. Uh, and then Nike is, continues to be in the news for, for varying reasons, but the company is still strong. Their earnings report's out after the bell on Tuesday, so make sure you check that out. And then, as I said, you look for North American sales growth, growth in greater China, e-commerce. Those, those, those are going to be the big three things. And then we'll see if there's any new news from Nike after that. But that does it for another episode of Full Court Finance. Until next time, I'm your host, Ben Rains. And remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at zax.com.